on this week's episode of Tomorrow. SpaceX's Dragon capsule returns to Earth. There's an exoplanet in our backyard. And I interviewed Dr. Barbara Cohen about lunar flashlights. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. Welcome to tomorrow, episode 9.26 for August 27th, 2016. I'm Jared Head. Right next to me is Space Mike. And then right next to Space Mike is the beautiful, the talented, the not my wife, Carrie Ann Higginbotham. And before we get started with our show, we first want to give a huge shout out to all of our tomorrow premiere patrons. These folks have given us $10 or more per episode to help crowdfund the shows of tomorrow. They get access to everything, immediate access to the show, immediate access to After Dark, uh, access to our Slack channel, where uh, this week you could have seen us talking back and forth and actually seen a preview of what our set is going to look like once we get it in here, and all of the other amazing things uh, that you get as a Tomorrow patron on Patreon. So, if you would like to help crowdfund the shows of Tomorrow, consider going over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Now, we have a fascinating episode for you later today. We've got, uh, what's, uh, Dr. Barbara Cohen from Lunar Flashlight, there you go. Uh, who will, Ben will be interviewing at the end of the news segment. And, of course, our news segment, we always like to start off with the launch. So, Mike, please take us away. Oh, man, and what a launch it was. We have an Ariane 5 launch that launched from Corot, French Guiana, and as always, these things take right off the pad. Let's check out the footage. And lift off. Décollage. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Very cool, very cool. This launched on Wednesday, August 24th at 2216 Coordinated Universal Time, carrying a pair of communication satellites. And this launch vehicle was the Ariane 5 ECA, which is the most the, power, the, po the most powerful configuration of the Ariane 5. It has a cryogenic upper stage fueled by liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen instead of the normal monomethyl hydrazine and nitrogen tetroxide, which is a storable propellant but very toxic, that they use on their upper stages known as the G, G+, and ES. So because of this extra capability with this upper stage, they were to deliver two pretty large payloads. In fact, this was the, the, the most heavy payload that they've had on an Ariane 5 launch, beating their last record by about five kilograms. Um, in any case, the payloads were, that were launched were Intel Sat 33E and Intel Sat 36. And 33E was riding in the top configuration and was deployed first during the launch. Both satellites are headed for geosynchronous orbit and are, they're going into an ear orbit near the equator, just off by a couple degrees. And Intel Sat 33E, which is built by Boeing, the one that you're seeing on screen now, is the next epic series of spacecraft with high-capacity satellite communications serving customers in Europe, the Middle East, Africa, and Asia Pacific. And then Intelsat 36, which was actually built by Space Systems Laurel, will be providing satellite TV service for the next 15 years to customers in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. So both pretty cool uh, uh, spacecraft. There's the, uh, the one that was built by Space Systems Systems Laurel. And both of these spacecraft, although for slightly different purposes, are furthering their, their pretty large network now of communication satellites, whether it be for uh, uh, internet access, communications, or TV broadcasting. So congratulations to Ariana Space, who is responsible for this launch, and to Intelsat for two more satellites that they were successfully able to put in orbit. And over the coming uh, weeks, they'll be doing their own maneuvers with thrusters on board the spacecraft to reach their final positions in geosync orbit. All right, well, that's excellent news to hear. We always like hearing launch providers getting their payloads where they need to. So excellent, excellent. Absolutely. So, so I want to tell you guys about something that happened earlier this week that's some very exciting news. You guys want to hear about it? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes. So you guys know that we're like finding exoplanets all over the place. Of course. And mm -hmm. uh, there's, we pretty much think that there are like planets around every single star. So it's some Hopefully, point in the yeah. star's life. Um, so guess what we found? 
we found an exoplanet going around the closest star to our sun, Proxima Centauri. And there's a really cool animation that shows it to you. So this is the one that we've been waiting for. It is only 4.25 light years away, and it's around a star called Proxima Centauri. So a 2012 study originally yielded false results, but scientists are now confident that there is a planet there about 30 times more massive than the Earth. So that means that that planet there, most likely a rocky, what we call terrestrial planet. And of course, we call it Proxima B, because when you are, your nomenclature and everything for exoplanets means that the star is known as capital A, and then you assign the planets lowercase letters after that, you know, with the <laughs> continuing the alphabet. So this one orbits only 7.3 million kilometers away from Proxima Centauri, uh, which means that it's 5% of the distance that the Earth orbits our sun. That makes its year 11.2 days. So in other words, we'd be really old if we were on this planet. Um, <laughs> wow. Now, you don't really have to worry too much about this, um, be, about you know, the potential of burning up there because Proxima Centauri is uh, sending out solar uh, radiation at a much lower intensity than our sun does. So it is actually within the habitable zone of the star there. And if you were standing on the surface, you'd see a dull red orb about three times the size of our sun. And the surface temperatures are estimated to be near somewhere about 33 degrees Celsius. So um, that's the estimate. They don't actually know whether it would be that warm or not. Uh, but here's some bad news to go with this good news. Um, even though this uh -oh. is in the habitable zone of the star, and it is the closest exoplanet that we know of, Proxima Centauri is a flare star. So what does that mean? That means that it can pop off solar flares as frequently as every 20 minutes. And, you know, that's basically bathing this planet in huge amounts of ultraviolet and X-ray radiation. Um, so if this planet has a very powerful magnetic field, far powerful than what we, our Earth has in terms of its magnetic field, should be okay for any potential habitability that may be there. Um, but for all we know, this planet could be as sterile as the inside of a nuclear reactor as well, because it's literally getting blasted constantly with huge amounts of radiation from Proxima Centauri. Yeah. Uh, but oh, man. really cool thing, I did talk about in the space pod earlier this year, the breakthrough initiative with Project Starshot, basically those little small uh, sat chip sats that they're gonna shoot with lasers up to like 20% of the speed of light. Well, Proxima Centauri was always the target for them. So now they've got something to actually go there for, besides <laughs> nice. just analyzing a star. You've got an exoplanet there. Um, and maybe this might start a really interesting discussion on potentially doing interstellar missions, because we now have a exoplanet within our cosmic backyard that, you know, moving at 10% of the speed of light, you could actually get there within a lifetime, you know, about 42 years. So pretty cool stuff. And uh, hopefully we'll get some more information from that once we get bigger telescopes um, in the coming yeah. years. So, and uh, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Uh, so was the chat room. Uh, Shire was saying, woohoo, road trip. Woo! Uh, <laughs> we take a long yes. time. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw somewhere that they said at the speed that Voyager 1 is moving, it would take you 78,000 years to get to Proxima Centauri. So uh, pack a lot of snacks. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> this, is, this just goes to you know, show that you know, setting up some sort of a really awesome robotic mission, or even with you know, human aspect, if it actually does turn out to be a really nice place, you know, looking at cryogenics and you know, singularity type cyborg uh, configurations. Right. But I mean, even though the 100 year Starship study, their goal is to send out an interstellar probe. And this to me sounds like a really good candidate since it's right next door. Yeah, oh, good man. target. A good way to describe the distance between our sun and Proxima Centauri, by the way, um, if our sun was a centimeter across, Proxima Centauri would be about 615 kilometers away. So just to give you an idea of the distances, and this is the closest star, so really far away stuff. Um, and speaking of a potential road trip, you know how you have to pack your car? Well, they ended up packing something on the International Space Station full of stuff. And Mike, why don't you go and tell us about that? 
That's right. So to bring things a little bit closer to home, uh, SpaceX's Dragon cargo capsule has returned to Earth. Uh, they went through the operations yesterday, Friday, August uh, 25th, and unburst the Dragon capsule from the International Space Station, and it performed its re-entry burn and returned to Earth uh, yesterday. And with this, the Dragon cargo capsule is actually the only vehicle of all the different cargo vehicles that visit the space station currently that can return cargo safely to Earth, and especially sensitive experiments. And for this particular one, it, it actually splashed down off the um, coast of Baja, California, about 525 kilometers away, or for those in the United States, that's 326 miles. And the spacecraft visited the station for visited the space station for 37 days, and it brought back several of the experiments and samples and hardware, including blood and urine samples, some of which were from the one-year space study. And it also brought back 12 living mice from a, a JAXA experiment. And it also brought back a faulty spacesuit that is going to be inspected on the ground. This is the one that has had all the leaking water problems and almost killed an astronaut a, a while back. And uh, with this, though, they're going to be able to check that out. And it's just, it's just a great capability to be able to bring this back. Now, the living mice, unfortunately, are going to be euthanized. And uh, the, the Japanese experimenters on this are going to remove some of their internal organs and do stem cell research on them. And this is kind of going along with the whole studies of how does prolonged exposure to microgravity affect the genetic transfer from, uh, from a progenitor to offspring. So uh, this is a very uh, interesting experiment and definitely something that we need to know uh, if we ever plan to reproduce in space and to you know, send out the human population to the stars. So uh, this is really cool. And I'm also excited to know uh, what sort of fixes they're going to do with this faulty spacesuit and, and hopefully prevent problems like that in the future. So uh, congratulations to SpaceX for this entirely successful mission. It's uh, being shipped back to Long Beach, California, where they're going to be handing off all those sensitive experiments to NASA and uh, make their progress from there. So very cool. Hey, Mike, there was a question in the chat room. Uh, Shire was asking, does SpaceX recover it also, or is there a NASA recovery team? Uh, uh, from what I know, it's, it's kind of a joint project. There is, a, a, of course, a maritime team that, that goes and recovers this, and they use several different um, uh, ships to accomplish this. I, don't, I do not know who owns that spacecraft, or excuse me, not spacecraft, that ship, just that regular naval ship, but I believe that it is a, a, a team of both SpaceX employees and NASA employees who recover that, that, the spacecraft. Very cool. All Thank right, you. excellent. Well, speaking of recovery, we have recovered a spacecraft that we haven't heard from in two years as a part of NASA's stereo mission. And this is really exciting um, because reestablishing contact with spacecraft after you've lost contact with them in space is really difficult, especially when they are dun, 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 on the other side of the sun. <laughs> now, STEREO is a two-probe mission to study the sun. One orbits a little bit closer than the Earth, one orbits a little bit further away from the Earth. That means the one closer orbits a little faster and it pulls ahead of the Earth. The one farther away from the Earth orbits a bit slower and it's, it pulls away from the Earth in the opposite direction. So that way these probes move relative around the sun to allow us a 360 degree view with the probes that we have in orbit or around the Earth or at the L1 point uh, between the Earth and the sun. Now during the solar conjunction, when the two probes go behind the sun and out of contact, uh, they expected contact to be reestablished at a certain point in stereo A came back into contact, but they were only able to get fragments of data back from Stereo B. And that ended up getting enough data back to show scientists that Stereo B's inertial measurement unit and star trackers were malfunctioning and firing thrusters to orient the probe in the wrong direction. This was back in 2014. So, uh, you know, that's a very long time to have your spacecraft um, out of commission. And last year, NASA started sending signals to Stereo B in the blind, basically saying, hey, you know, to orient yourself in this direction, uh, reset this system, reset that system. And last Sunday on August 21st at uh, 2227 Coordinated Universal Time, Stereo B sent back a signal and said, hey, what's happening? <laughs> and basically did a quick status update of itself. So they're now I'm back. still here. Yeah, I'm hey, I'm still exactly. here. I'm still working. Where have you guys been? <laughs> um, so uh, so uh, they're now going to look at what happened to Stereo B. They think that the spacecraft is fully functional and it's going to resume its mission. So uh, awesome. that's a pretty interesting thing to end up. It went mono. <laughs> yes, it did.
So sorry, it took me a little while to figure that one out there, Ben. Thank you. Uh, a little slow. I need some more coffee. Yeah, let's do that. This morning. All coffee right. Break. So, hey, Space Mike, tell us about something that's happening on the International Space Station. So uh, with the, this mission that I talked about just a second ago, the CRS-9 mission, one of the big pieces of hardware that they brought up to the space station was called an International Docking Adapter. And actually last week on August 19th, astronauts Jeff Williams and Kate Rubens finished the installation of that International Docking Adapter to one of the PMA adapters, one of the pressurized mating adapters. And uh, they, they did this by, they had already moved the International Docking Adapter in place with the, the station's robotic arm. And and they were just connecting the, the, the last pieces of connections that needed to be on there, shutting off some of the reflectors and sensors on the PMA adapter, the black part that you see in the video, and churning on everything for the international docking adapter. And with this, this is the whole reason that they're doing this is because it's needed to accommodate the new the visiting vehicles, like with the ones under the commercial crew program, that are not going to be using the old shuttle docking system. But it's also for a more important reason, to have a low impact docking to prevent structural damage to the space station. This will make docking operations safer for both the station the visiting, and the visiting vehicles and the crews occupying both. And also with the new standard for a calming docking system, new vehicles can use this type of docking adapter as well. Even Orbital ATK has considered upgrading the Cygnus cargo vehicle to use this international docking adapter so that they could dock with the station instead of being berthed to the station. With docking, a visiting vehicle gains access to the station's power supply and data cut capabilities automatically. But whenever they berth a vehicle, all of those connections have to be made manually and is pretty time consuming. And with this, they'll be able to, to if they did this with the Cygnus vehicle, it would save a lot of time of being able to uh, connect and transfer cargo right away. And you know, it would just be able to free up more time for the astronauts to, to do experiments. And in this video that you're seeing, um, the, the astronaut that has the red uh, arm band is Jeff Williams. And this is actually his fourth space flight. And then the spacesuit that is, is just all white that doesn't have the red arm band is Kate Rubens. And this is her first extravehicular activity. So uh, they were able to complete all, all of the tasks necessary and completed the installation of the international docking adapter. And they even did a couple of, of extra tasks as well to set up for that extra extravehicular activity. Dang it, I said that again. Their additional extravehicular activity that they're going to be doing later on uh, next month. And I talked about that in our last live show for what those tasks would be for that additional EVA that they're going to be conducting. So uh, very cool that they were able to do this. And uh, that hopefully clears the way for some of the new cargo, commercial cargo vehicles that might be launching as soon as the end of next year. So Yeah, they did a fantastic job on that EVA to do all those get ahead tasks uh so absolutely that was, that was fantastic also jeff williams set a new uh record for uh, american he astronauts uh, can, uh cumulative time in space this week so um he surpassed uh scott kelly's uh 520 days if i remember correctly so he's you know adding on days uh from here on out so pretty cool stuff happening on the space yeah. station all right so i want to talk about something that happened a little bit earlier today that is a little bit farther out than the space station but just a little bit which is that the juno <laughs> spacecraft actually has made has already made its closest approach to jupiter uh, but did that about eight hours ago um and it was skimming the cloud tops at about 4200 kilometers so holy or, or uh, excuse me 4200 kilometers and holy moly that is close and when it skimmed those cloud tops it was moving at about 208,000 kilometers an hour. That is That's crazy. That is fast. Um, now, this is the closest Juno will get to Jupiter during its prime mission. And this is also the first close pass with all of the science instruments on. And this image that we have up right now is actually taken on August 23rd, so just a few days ago by Juno. And we can see the great red spot on Jupiter there. Uh, the image on your left there is in true color. So if you were there, that's what it would look like. The image on the right there is using an infrared filter to highlight where methane is in Jupiter's atmosphere. And the methane is those dark areas. And you can see that the great red spot, very white, very little methane in that area. Now, this will provide the highest resolution images of Jupiter's atmosphere that we have ever gotten. And we're expecting them to be downlinked and released to the public by later next week. And this is the first of the 36 orbits that Jupiter or that Juno is going to be doing around Jupiter. And I am so excited to see those pictures of Jupiter's atmosphere because they are going to be 
fantastic. Because literally the best images that we have of Jupiter's atmosphere came from Voyager 1. That's wow. how long ago that those high resolution images came back from. So I'm super excited to see uh, the resolution from Juno Cam um, and get that. I'm really excited. We didn't have any HD resolution images from Galileo? No, uh, Galileo had the problem with its high gain antenna. Um, so it had, oh, to, it had to run everything through right. its low gain system. So we ended up getting back compressed data. Um, from yeah. that, so the resolution wasn't as great. Also, uh, that's right because we we did have the capability with it. We just couldn't actually send those quality images back. Yeah. Also, they had a lot of problems with the data that's tape right. on board of Galileo as well, which meant that they had to be very very careful with the amount of data that they put on the tape itself. So there was some time. There was one time I remember where they literally rewound the tape and then accidentally left rewind on for like three hours, and they were worried that they stress the tape, so they had to be very, very careful um, with everything. And then in addition to that, it also flew through Jupiter's radiation belts. Uh, and, you know, that, I mean, typically flying through radiation doesn't work well for, you anything? know, ro ro yeah, anything, robots or people, so I just wouldn't recommend it. Um, so, yeah, that's why Juno is getting so close in its orbit, is to dive between those radiation belts and the cloud tops of Jupiter, hoping to preserve the instruments. But even with that, they're still only expecting Juno Cam to work for seven to eight orbits before radiation completely destroys the instrument. Ah, uh, because so. Trebles was asking in the room, like, no more close passes of Jupiter by Juno? Uh, no, every pass will be close, um, right? simply because we're like, don't go through the radiation. Um, so every one of those passes will be close. And the end of mission is supposed to happen in February 2018, and they're expecting, because it's having to get so close to the radiation belts, that they're not going to be able to extend the mission. So they'll just fire the engine, burn it up in Jupiter's atmosphere, and, and you know, that way it doesn't contaminate the moons in the area. Gotcha. Um, but we'll see, you know. We, we, I mean, we thought the Mars Exploration Rovers were only going to work for 90 days, and here we are, gosh, what, 12 and a half years later with opportunity. So yeah. we'll see, you know. We tend to be pretty good at building spacecraft. So closer passes, but not necessarily closer pictures. Yes, exactly. Uh, that's, <laughs> that's the best way to do it. All right, so... <laughs> We are now going to go ahead and, yeah, we're going to take our first break of the show. And when we come back, Ben will be interviewing Dr. Barbara Cohen about the upcoming lunar flashlight mission. So stay tuned, and we'll see you right after this break. Look into her face, determination in her eyes. She won't give up a quick or for a little fashion lies. Fill the thoughts of expectation. This girl's a fascination. And welcome to Tomorrow Now. Before we get started with our interview, I did want to give a huge shout out to all of the patrons of Tomorrow who helped make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are our Patreon premiere members. These are people who have contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. And a huge shout out to all of the new premiere members. We've had more premiere members uh, getting added this week since I think, I believe, the history of the show. So welcome to all of our new premiere members. Uh, we also have our Patreon producers. These are people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. And each one of these different levels gets a different reward. So check our different sections over at patreon.com slash tmro to see what kind of reward level you can get. Uh, it starts at one penny and goes all the way up to $10 or more. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, we're joined by Dr. Barbara Cohen from the Marshall Space Flight Center. She's the uh, lead of the Planetary Science Group there. Also works on uh, as a principal investigator for a bunch of other projects, including the Lunar Flashlight. So welcome, uh, Barbara, to the show. Thanks, Ben. I'm happy to be here. All right, let's talk about uh, Lunar Flashlight a little bit. First off, it's a really cool name. What is it? <laughs> lunar Flashlight is a very small satellite. Uh, it's about 10 centimeters by 20 centimeters by 30 centimeters. So it's about the size of two loaves of bread. Um, we call it a 6U CubeSat. Um, in CubeSat worlds, a cube is 10 by 10 by 10 centimeters. And if you stack six of them together, it's six U's or six units. So it's a very small satellite and it's going to go to the moon and we're going to look for exposed water ice. Now exposed water ice probably only exists in very, very, very cold places, like the permanently shadowed regions of the lunar poles. So we're gonna skim over the lunar south pole and we're gonna look for water ice in those permanently shadowed regions. Now, of course, if you just had a camera 
or a spectrometer that was a passive instrument, you would use sunlight bouncing off of those areas and collect those photons to look at them. Permanently shadowed regions, of course, don't have sunlight bouncing into them. So we had to take an active illuminator. That's our flashlight. So we're taking four lasers with us. We're going to shine them down into those shadowed regions. We're going to collect those photons, and we're going to look at the spectrum that comes back. And water ice is going to absorb some of those photons. So if we get fewer photons back than we sent, and we know that water ice absorbed them, if we get all the photons back that we sent, we know there's no water ice there. And what does that get? Let's say we find some water ice. Uh, I mean, we found water on the moon. Uh, we've looked for different things. A couple times. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly right. So it feels like we've, we've found this before. So what, what does this specific thing get us? Sure. So water on the moon, like water on Mars, we discover it a bunch of times. But actually, scientifically, each one is different. And it means a different thing for people who may want to go there and use those resources. So the water on the moon that we know about now, there's water locked in the minerals, very, very small amounts. That's not something that you're going to be able to crack open a mineral and drink. So it's, it's, it's scientifically interesting, but not a great resource. Same for the water that's on the surface that's from the solar wind interaction. So as hydrogen comes streaming in from the sun and it interacts with the silicate mineral, silicates are 50% oxygen, those hydrogens and those oxygens bond and make H2O molecules. But again, one molecule on the surface isn't enough to drink. We do know that at the poles there are deep deposits of water, ice. Um, we know that from radar measurements but underneath a meter or more of lunar regolith. And lunar regolith is very hard to dig through. Imagine having to dig in your yard a meter or more. That's a lot of work to do just to get to something. So what we're looking for specifically is accessible water frost that maybe humans could go use in the future. And we could use this for a number of things, um, for potentially drinking, but more likely for like rocket fuel and things like that for habitation on the moon? Sure, absolutely. Anything that you need hydrogen and oxygen or water for. All right. Uh, and possibly other elements, too. There may be other things in there mixed with it that you could use, something like methane or ammonia or CO2, anything like that as well. <laughs> also things you probably wouldn't want to drink. Um, uh, uh, what's really interesting about this particular mission is w how it's going up. You're not going up on an Atlas or a Delta. You're actually going right. up on one of the first space launch systems. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure, so the exploration mission one for the space launch system is going to be the first time that we check out that whole rocket stack. You might remember a couple years ago we sent the Orion on a Delta as a checkout flight, but this is the first time we're going to stack that Orion on top of the big monster rocket and we're going to send that whole stack out. Orion's going to do a loop around the moon and come back, but while it's doing that, we're going to deploy 13 different CubeSats, actually. So they're in the adapter ring between the Orion and the rocket. There's space in there for a whole bunch of little satellites. They're all going to be 6U satellites. They're all going to be the same size. But the great thing about going on this rocket is that we get beyond low Earth orbit. We don't get deployed in Earth orbit. And that means you can use low impulse in space propulsion methods to go to different places in the solar system. So we're using green propulsion to go to the moon. Other people are going to be using things like ammonia. There's a mission called Nia Scout that's going to be using a big solar sail to go to an asteroid. So these kinds of things don't have enough propulsion or a lift to get us off the Earth, but they have enough to move us around the solar system once we get out of Earth's gravity well. Actually, that worked out brilliantly because both Shire and Warp 11 asked what kind of propulsion you're using uh, to, to move around. So uh, the, the next question coming up is Space Mike, which says, will you be going into a polar lunar orbit to investigate the poles? Yep, good question. We are going into a polar lunar orbit. That means that we have to spend some time getting into the correct plane. So we do a couple Earth flybys to change our plane get into sort of a polar orientation, get captured into a low energy transfer and spiral down around the pole. And you guys were talking before about how close Juno's getting to Jupiter. Lunar flashlight's gonna get within 20 kilometers of the South Pole. That's pretty sporty. Is that the end of the mission when you're getting that close? Uh, or are you, nope. are you using, you're slinging by at that point? Yeah, we have a very elliptical orbit. And so the Paraloon's gonna be about 20 kilometers and the Apolloon's gonna be about 9,000 kilometers. It's going to take us about 12 hours to do a single orbit, but we're only taking data right over the South Pole. And of course, to get the best signal with a very small laser in a very small satellite, we need to get very close to the surface. What kind of power are you going to be using on the vehicle, and how long do you think it's going to last? 
Well, we have solar panels um, that power the vehicle, and those will last a good long time. There's no problems with that. Our lasers are powered with standard lithium-ion batteries, actually, and so they'll probably last a good long time, too. We think that um, because we are coming so close to the pole, we get perturbed by the gravitational field of the moon quite a bit, and we'll have to do trajectory corrections pretty much every trajectory. Um, and that's going to uh, deplete our propulsion. We use most of our propulsive force to get into the transfer orbit, to get into the capture orbit. Um, and then we'll only have a little bit left to do these kind of corrections. And when that runs out, that'll be the end of the mission. And what's, do you have any like awesome plans for the end of the mission, like crashing into the moon <laughs> and doing something neat? Well, we are going to crash into the moon. There are restrictions on all missions, of course, as to how you can dispose of the mission. And for lunar missions, we have to have a disposal plan that takes us away from the Apollo historic sites. So we can't just let it crash wherever we want it to. We're going to have to do a controlled uh, litho-breaking maneuver. Um, and so we'll probably do that somewhere around a pole. Um, unfortunately, it's going to be too small, I think, to be seen by any of our orbiting assets. And LRO, our Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we hope will be there, but there's no guarantee that that'll be there at the time to observe it anyway. It won't be observable from Earth. It's pretty small. Would, would L, if LRO yeah. was, if the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter was in the right position, would it be able to see it? Or is it, I mean, you're, you're pretty tiny. It's pretty tiny. I think we would have to um, do some before and after imaging. I'm, I'm not sure that it could see it. Actually, a question from uh, one of my co-hosts asking, how much off-the-shelf components, how many off-the-shelf components is Lunar Flashlight using? That's a really great question, and it's one of the reasons I tried to make the distinction in the beginning that Lunar Flashlight and these other satellites are not really CubeSats as we understand them. CubeSats have grown to be an amazing part of um, spacecraft building that even university students can do by buying kits and assembling them and launching them. Um, those kits typically have uh, components that are designed for Earth orbit, right? So we're inside a nice magnetosphere and we don't have a lot of radiation. And once you're in Earth orbit, you don't need a lot of propulsion. So typically they don't have all the things that we need to have. Also, we need a radio that can send and receive an X-band because that's how far away the moon is. We can't use the UHF, for example. So we have a lot of components that are not off the shelf. They are spacecraft components, interplanetary spacecraft components. Um, we hope that things like the radio will become uh, catalog items, these very small components, very small electronics, um, rad hard electronics. So we hope that some of these will become catalog items, but right now they're pretty much custom. So the U part, or the CubeSat part of it, is really the external envelope, and everything inside of it is custom. So taking kind of that concept and the idea of the Space Launch System being able to bring you a lot further than normal, uh, using off-the-shelf components and the Space Launch System combined, are you going to be able to go out further using lower cost satellite for other missions? Because I know you do a lot more than just lunar flashlight. Are you looking at these combination of things for things in the future? Yes, exactly. Um, all of these CubeSats are very much pathfinders for doing planetary science with these very, very small buses. I think that um, in our development, what we've seen, some of the um, difficulties that we've had to overcome and some of the challenges that we've had, I think really point to the best use of these satellites as maybe daughter ships to larger missions and sending them into environments where you wouldn't want to send your main satellite. So exactly what you were talking before about Jupiter's radiation belts, you know, maybe you could send some of these into the Great Red Spot as probes. For things like Enceladus, where you've got plumes, maybe you could send one of these through the plume. If you were trying to perturb an asteroid, maybe you could crash one of these into an asteroid and watch from a larger spacecraft bus. So I think these, as daughter satellites, are going to be very helpful and very capable to be able to communicate back to their uh, mother spacecraft rather than communicating all the way back to the Earth, having to bring all their own propulsion, things like that. Now, are you tied to the Space Launch System? Uh, you know, rockets with NASA, unfortunately, are tied to politics. We're about to get a new president. <laughs> There's not a zero chance that Space Launch System will be canceled. So can you go on an Atlas or a Delta instead? We have a design guideline to be compatible with other rockets. But honestly, the Space Launch System and the CubeSats are 
tied together um, because we want to be able to show the capability of the space launch system, not just for Orion, but for other payloads and secondary payloads as well. So we're very excited to be a part of the space launch system. Uh, talking about communication a little bit further, uh, uh, Kay McCoy asks, uh, does the lunar flashlight use a deep space network to talk to Earth, or do we have some kind of system to talk to a lunar spacecraft that isn't quite as big as this deep space network? Maybe uh, TDRS, which is a uh, tracking data re uh, relay satellite system, uh, something like that. Or are you just using just regular old antenna, like a really big array on Earth? Right, yeah, so we looked at losing TDRS. A lot of lunar missions have looked at using TDRS as well. Um, there are some very special uh, configurations or geometry that you might be able to use TDRS. We're not in one of them, so we are using the Deep Space Network. We uh, are launching in 2018, we hope. Um, we don't know that the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter will be there for us as a relay satellite. So we are having to, we're required to take our own communication to correspond with the, or to talk to the Deep Space Network. Is that a problem you're working on solving? Because uh, if you're going to be sending a bunch of CubeSats up and you want these smaller satellites, bringing huge communication arrays isn't going to be something you can do. Are, are you guys working on an um, intergalactic communication network, so to speak? <laughs> um, I don't think so. I know there are plans for the Deep Space Network to keep going and to upgrade its 35-meter um, dishes. We only need the 35-meter dishes for lunar. Um, a lot of universities actually are very interested in having their own um, antennas to be able to talk to their CubeSats, and they already do that. Universities talk to their own CubeSats in low Earth orbit. There are some that would like to upgrade to have that capability to talk to deep space CubeSats as well. Uh, space Mike asks if you have any other lunar missions coming up that are kind of cool. Yeah, so on that uh, same mission, the EM-1, there are a couple other lunar CubeSats. Um, Skyfire um, out of Lockheed Martin is going to make a flyby of the moon and makes the measurements and then go out into deep space. Um, there are two other orbiters. One is Luna Map. There's Luna with an H, like here in Boston, Luna Map. Um, and it has a big H because it's looking for hydrogen deposits. So when we talked earlier, we're looking for the water on the surface. There's also water buried deep underneath. And that, this Luna Map is going to be looking for those at very high resolution. So it's going to make a skimming orbit just like ours. It's going to come down very close to the South Pole. You're working on some very, very, very cool things. Where can people go to get more information, not just on Lunar Flashlight, but all the projects you're working on? Well, you can go to the NASA Marshall Planetary website. It's called planetary.mfsc.nasa.gov. I'll say, I was looking at your bio before I let you guys look at your bio, and my favorite line in there is that you're, you're uh, a lunatic at the very right. bottom. I thought that was absolutely <laughs> hilarious. I thought that was brilliant. But I love this. This is great. Uh, That's my license plate, too. <laughs> oh, really? That's fantastic. Well, now I'll know. If we're ever up, uh, uh, up at Marshall Space Flight Center, we'll see. Uh, That's lunatic. Right. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of your Saturday to join us. Uh, it was a great amount of fun. I hope you won't be, won't be a stranger to the show. And we're looking forward to the launch of uh, SLS on Exploration Mission, Mission 1 to watch Lunar Satellite and a bunch of other CubeSats and uh, Orion. It's going to be awesome. Yep, it'll be great. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, comments from last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We've always looked to the stars. They guide us, give us comfort, help us find our way. We see ourselves out there. When we look up, it inspires us. And we long for something we don't yet know. We yearn to go there. So, we venture forth. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize a vision of this. Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. The exploration of space will go ahead, whether we join in it or not. Many think we stopped exploring. But we know. Our journey didn't end. 
we've only just begun. Orion is functioning perfectly at this point. Come with us and explore tomorrow. Welcome back to the show. These two, these two, go back, go to, go to camera one. These two are just cracking themselves up. They, they loved the comment. They, just the whole break, they wait, loved wait, the comment. Wait, 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 let me say, she was a great interview. Like, this is yes, the only, that like, was a fantastic interview. I loved it. John DeParker was, was amazing. Uh, but she had this the one, one line, line where she's like, you know, Luna, what's it, was Luna Map? Luna, she goes, Luna, like, with nah. an H, like, you're from Boston, like, Luna Map. And I, <laughs> and I have a, we have a coworker that is from Boston. It's exactly how he sounds. Like, I left my khakis and my khakis. But <laughs> it just... It was like the best explanation, and I, I was laughing so hard. I was actually afraid you I guys were going to hear me I was doing everything I could to keep a straight face, and she's breaking, <laughs> she's cracking up in the middle of the interview. Oh I'm like, God. we're talking about real things here. It was, and it was awesome, oh and I was excited. At least I was paying attention. You could tell I was paying attention. <laughs> that was a great, oh, oh my, my God, goodness. that was a fantastic so awesome. I'll tell you, Dr. Cohen. I'll tell you, the number one thing that drives me crazy right now about our oh shows is that goodness. we have to hang up on our guests uh, like before and after their interview so we can bring Space Mike back in. Not that we don't love you, Space Mike. Yeah, no, I'm but sorry, it, guys. No, it drives me crazy that we have to do that. So uh, oh what helps us to get the equipment so that we don't have to hang up on our guests are our patrons. And we'll start off with our premiere members. These are people who've contributed $10 or more to this specific episode. Uh, and they're gonna get, uh, they get access to our Slack channel, which is a ton of fun. You get a yes. lot of inside information peeks into my brain which are scary scary uh, they're very scary <laughs> you get the 3d renderings of what the set's going to look like uh you know if, if you ever have any questions ask any one of the uh, uh patron premiere members about our slack channel they'll give you they'll be like oh yeah that place is uh cool is not the right word but certainly jam-packed with things all right uh we also have our producers these are people who've contributed five dollars or more to this specific episode they're going to get access to uh after dark right away when it's available they get access uh some inside access to the show they don't get access to the slack channel uh but they also get access to um the hangouts and we have those and we also have our patreon plus subscribers these are people who are going to uh, who have contributed $2.50 or more to this specific episode of the show, and they are going to get access to After Dark as soon as it's available. But oh wait, there's more! You can contribute as little as one penny to this show. These are our patrons. If you just want to get your name in the show, you want to help us out any way you can, consider contributing one penny to the show. Actually, I did have a user on Reddit, and I apologize, I haven't responded yet, uh, having an issue contributing like one penny to the show. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's still possible, but you should be able to do it. Patreon is like, you can't do that. Uh, so uh, we'll get to the bottom of it. But I'm pretty sure you can contribute as little as one penny up to $2.49. For more information on the different reward levels and how you can help us do things and our different goals, head on over to patreon.com slash TMRO. It's probably one of those things where it costs more for them to process it. Than might be. It might be. They, there might be a minimum <laughs> where that you have to go over the credit card processing fee in right. order to. And I don't know what that minimum is, but it didn't used to be like that. So right. if that's a change, I don't know what that new number is. Right. So I'll let you guys know as soon as I find out. So it might be that you have to contribute 50 cents per show. If you do that, your, your total out of pocket would be about $2 per month. Uh, and that, this is all American, right? So I know the other issue was this was not an American currency, so maybe it ended up being less than one. I don't know. Anyhow. Something that I've heard with Patreon is that the new minimum is a dollar now, and they won't even do anything less than that. But that, mm -hmm. it's just rumor. I don't know that for it sure. It might be a dollar so. per month, though, right? So Maybe uh, so. It might depend on if it's the monthly basis or the per video basis. If, if it is a dollar, then uh, I believe the minimum for our show would be 25 cents per episode because mm -hmm. we should have four mm -hmm. episodes mm -hmm. per month mm -hmm. and 25 cents would bring you to a dollar. So um, there you go. I don't know. Uh, that would make sense because of credit card processing. Yep. All right, uh, let's go ahead and get, well, before we get started with comments from last week's show, uh, you had a fantastic space pod in which you mocked the name TMRO. I don't know if anyone- Yes, I did. You did because so. you said we have a no acronym policy and you said even though we are TMRO. Here's the thing to understand though. <laughs> I'm getting, getting, the literal I'm, definition of what an acronym is. I'm getting schooled in front of mm. the internet. We, we have. have. We, we, we you, have. You guys couldn't hear Dada, but he said we've had this discussion before. Mm. TMRO is not an acronym. Just it's saying. an abbreviation. It's an abbreviation. Oh, okay. We don't have a no abbreviations oh, yeah. policy. We have a no acronyms policy. Yes. So technically speaking, we maintain our policy with our own. I was going to actually, ha I forgot to, gr I was going to grab that clip and then mock you. I was going to slowly turn like this. 
and stare at you <laughs> on camera. <sighs> Another way of thinking about it is almost Sorry. like a uh, text message millennial shorthand. Mm. <laughs> now, I'm gonna, and, and before we get into comments, uh, just mentally from uh, Dr. Cohen's interview, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm wishy-washy on SLS because uh, I don't like the price. Um, Orion, I don't, there's like, it, there are all these missions to nowhere, but where it gets really cool are things like this, yes. enabling CubeSats to go to places and enabling all of this new stuff that we couldn't do before and having this super heavy lift launcher that can put potentially CubeSats into the planetary system and get them way out there. So now we can yeah. have like one launch isn't a satellite. One launch isn't a module for a space station. One launch could be like a hundred or a thousand CubeSats exploring not just low Earth orbit, but the entire solar system. Imagine the planetary science we could do. Yeah. I mean, I am, uh, that is fantastic. I, mean, I, I love yeah. that idea. I think that is so awesome. Taking uh, instruments and being able to build them into a one unit CubeSat and then launching a thousand CubeSats and having uh, like 10 CubeSat or 10 CubeSats of the same instrument and just doing like this cosmic buckshot at your target. <laughs> Bam! <laughs> so that would be so cool. Like, imagine awesome. you could do that at Europa. Some of your spacecraft are going to directly impact Europa. Some yeah. of them are going to skim across the surface at like a couple kilometers. Some of them will give you uh, a wide field of view because they'll be a couple hundred kilometers away from I it. wonder what so. L-Cross, a modern day L-Cross mission would look like with that kind of tech. That would be amazing. Right? Because now you don't just have one impactor. You don't have to, you could have hundreds of impactors. It'd be you like a sensor. Sure, sure. No, but again, you go back to keeping the Apollo site as Oh, of course, of course, possible. of course. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Uh, she, she, she said that, and I, just I, I, she too, said that yeah. and I'm going through my head. I'm like, you can't go towards Apollo. And she's like, we can't go towards Apollo. <laughs> <laughs> you can't go, go towards the Russian historic sites either. Yeah, and yeah. I guess we, now the Chinese too, since they have their lander there. Yeah, we're going to have to stop that at some point, right? We're going to have to draw a line in the regolith, so to speak, and say, <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like really sharp sand, uh, and say, you know, missions after this date um, are okay to go to. And the other thing is, what is that keep out zone going to look like for the Apollo missions? Because eventually, as humanity does settle the moon, which will happen in my lifetime, gosh darn it, we will have, we will have, we will have settlements on the moon. We will have a lunar colony. Uh, as we do that, uh, we're going to want to go to those places. We're going to want to go to the Apollo, but, like we're going to want to almost build it into a lunar museum. Yeah. But just the act of going there is going to ruin it because you're going to ruin like the footprints and whatnot. So that's yeah. a much larger conversation, not in the scope of this show. I was going to say, isn't one of the things for the Google Lunar X Prize like take a picture of a historic from site? like away from but yet, from away? Yeah, yeah. from oh, the okay. edge of the. I, I didn't. So. I didn't know what the it's distance like, is beep. for it. So. Yeah, like, ah, <laughs> look at this, the no. poop bag from Armstrong, you know, something like that. So. Although if we could That's get that back, went, please. <laughs> no. Oh, wait. No, gross. That's no, not right. on the moon. This show has derailed quickly. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we were supposed to be talking about comments. last show's comments. Sorry. Uh, talk Capcom. About poop. Capcom, take us away. No surprise there. Uh, previous show's topic, of course, was an interview <laughs> with Deep Space Industries' Daniel Faber. Uh, this one comes from Zapfan Zapfan off of YouTube. That is an awesome username. Zapfan. Zap Zap <laughs> oh, no, go back. Go back. How's that? Zap Zapfan. Zapfan. Zap Am I doing backwards? <laughs> Zapfan. Zap I don't even know if I'm there doing you it. Go. Is it. I can't. There we go. Now I can is see it. There is we go. it this one? Zapfan. Oh, yeah. All right. That, that way. Very cool. Zapfan. Zapfan. Zap <laughs> <laughs> see, so Dr. Cohen is all like, oh, these guys seem quasi professional. And then we yeah. get into and this part of the show. This. She's like, oh, God, no. We're like, let's go pick up poop. That fan. Oh man, yeah, seriously, this show completely derailed and it was my fault. Go ahead. So Cap much for... <clears throat> I just got excited about SL. Oh, go ahead. It's great. Uh, I Sorry. wonder what the defensive launch prices with reusable rockets will do. The business case of making stuff in space. One kilogram of water in low Earth orbit to the International Space Station now costs maybe $30,000. Is that the way I'm supposed to be reading that? Uh, if you send That's out a craft <laughs> and <laughs> cook an asteroid and bring it back 10 tons of water, now it's worth $300 million. If the rapid and fully reusable rocket becomes a reality, what uh, that might drop a hundredfold to three million. What? Uh, I can't speak. I'm so sorry. Will that maybe mean that launching stuff from Earth will be less expensive after all, at least to low Earth orbit? 
And this goes back to the conversation I think that we've had so many times. We need gas stations in space everywhere, all over to the different destinations that we want to go, whether it be low Earth orbit or the moon or Mars or any of the other planets in our solar system, and maybe even Proxima B someday. And we need that. And so I, I completely agree with, uh, with Zapfan Zapfan's uh, assessment here that it, it will be cheaper as long as we can refuel stuff and, and reuse things. Mm. I'm not sure that's like what Zapan Zapan's saying, though. Zapan Zapan's saying, won't it be less expensive for us to pull water up from Earth to low Earth orbit than it will be to go mine water from the moon and bring it to a fuel depot? Right? Isn't that, a, isn't that the core of what Zapan Zapan is saying? I guess I misunderstood that because I guess the way that I was looking at this comment was from, from the perspective of getting that water from, uh, from, the, from an asteroid and having it, it being more words from that, but I guess I just so, I misunderstood the, the I don't know, this, I, I don't know, I, I mean... That's because I didn't read it correctly. That's <laughs> totally not your fault. So I, I, think, I think fundamentally, at first, doing anything in space is going to be more expensive. Like going to an asteroid and mining its water, going to the moon and mining its water will of course be more expensive. But it doesn't have to stay that way. And if we're going to colonize the solar system, we have to figure out the water problem. There's water everywhere. Mm -hmm. We just need to be able to get to it and use it. And we need to use it to sustain human life as well as turn it into rocket fuel. And we cannot bring the oceans of Earth to, <laughs> up into space. A, it, they're a finite resource, right? We're, we, yes. just, we can't take all of our oceans and dump them into space. That's not going to be a thing that we do. That's a bad idea. That's a ba also, B, it's a bad idea. Bad idea. Uh, so if we're going to do this in the long term, it's more than flags and footprints, humanity colonizing the solar system, right. then we're going to have to figure this out. And so, yeah, at first it might cost more, but ultimately this is what we have to do. So that's where all of this comes into play. You have to it's, eat. It's more, it's more than just money. It's, it's, it's the whole process, the whole thing. Yeah, you have to eat some cost in order to actually be able to bring the cost down. Exactly, so. exactly. All right, next up, Capcom. Um, really quickly, uh, we were talking about the, the... Oh, yeah, a comment on a comment? Yes, pretty much. Uh, Vax Hedrum uh, in our chat room says that water is basically $80,000 per gallon. So eight pounds is you know, around your uh, 10K. Imagine that for a moment. If you bring up about. a gallon of water, bring a gallon of water to space, take a gallon jug, fill it with water, put it in a rocket. That costs you $80,000 to do. Cool. That's so a little expensive. That $3 smart water doesn't seem that expensive anymore. <laughs> 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 to, get, to get into to orbit. orbit. Yeah, people can't hear Doug. We can hear him in our ear, but he can't speak to you anymore. Yeah, that's low Earth orbit. <laughs> but that's low way. Earth orbit, yeah. yeah. So that's, that's, why not, that's not even getting it to, like, Juno. To Juno. To Ju <laughs> to <laughs> the no. planet is now known as Juno. No, that's, that's okay. Jupiter's wife. <laughs> yeah, yes. As I was schooled yeah. in my comments on my space pod. So, <laughs> All um, right. So. All right. And that's, and that's why, you know, also recycling your resources is so important, too. You know, taking mm -hmm. in the, the humidity and the urine and, re, and reprocessing that into drinking water in order to save that amount of money. Although there's a lot of that on the International Space Station right now. Yeah, and that's why, it's, mm -hmm. and, you know, there were a lot of things that they, they had to figure out first with it. Mm -hmm. Like, they didn't realize that because of uh, microgravity, you were going to dump calcium out of your urine and end up clogging the system. So that's kind of a good good thing to learn, you know. Learn in, that here learn before that you lower go Earth orbit, there. Not, yeah. not mm -hmm. uh, out in deep space. So. All right, next up. Uh, the next uh, comment is coming off of YouTube. This one comes from Alpha HR. Or Alpha. 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 Or, is that a, from is Bastin. It, is that an, a hard H? <laughs> is that? <laughs> Alpha. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. Uh, being able Sorry. to review an orbit would be a boon to the space industry. Boon, not boom. Look at the all the upper stages. <laughs> oh, <laughs> they can man. be redesigned. Okay, look at all the upper stages. They can be redesigned to be used for quote unquote space tractors to be used for salvage, repositioning satellites, etc., etc. Actually, yeah. I think that's really where Cis Lunar One Thousand comes into play from United Launch Alliance. And I'm trying to. I'm working with their uh, public affairs to try to get someone on, anyone, I don't really care who, to talk about their future plans, both with Vulcan and Cislunar 1000, because I think that'd be a really interesting show. Yeah. Um, we should try to, um, we should try to get a, I believe his name is George Sowers. Uh, I believe he's one of the heads of the Cislunar 1000, and uh, I spoke to him at a conference once, and, and he would be a very, a very great person. He's the one who I've been getting all the media uh, sources from. He's been the one putting out all of the different uh, media and, and uh, great infographics from ULA for what the Cislunar 1000 program would be. And and forgive me, I, I'm, I'm going to kill myself if I'm getting this wrong later, but I believe his name is George Sowers. 
Okay. S O W E R A. If anyone has contact information where we can kind of skirt around PAO to make this actually happen, because uh, they're taking forever uh, in the amount of time it's taking them to answer. We've already yeah. booked all of September, um, almost all of October, yeah. and the rest of August. So uh, this interview at, at its soonest would be the last week in October, or most likely now November, uh, simply because that's how long they're taking to get back to me. So if someone knows someone uh, at United Launch Alliance who is uh, integral to Syslunar 1000 and who can come on the show and talk about what they're doing, that would be awesome. Let me know. Benjamin at TMRO.TV. All right, next up. Yeah. Next up comes off of Patreon. This one's from Tarantula. Uh, so much of our future in space depends on the ability to harvest resources and interact with different systems to create interplanetary commerce. Gas stations are a must. I'm excited to see, I'm excited to one day see that wicked space station consumption. Construction. I can't talk. It's all good. <sighs> I too am excited. I'm excited to one day see <laughs> Wicked Space Station construction graphics become a reality. This is why TMRO rocks. Rocks like the uh, what we're going to mine in space. Oh! <laughs> oh! Oh! Boom! Oh! oh! The sad thing is he had to wait for me to say the sentence correctly to get to the next sentence in order to say that. <laughs> uh, I did. I was waiting for a while. <laughs> I was waiting for a while. Uh, oh, yeah, goodness. so the other, thing to, the other thing to consider is that uh, we need chemical rockets to get out of our ground gravity well here on Earth. Yes. Right. We don't have technology today that um, um, allows us any other way to get out of our own gravity yeah. well. However, once we're out of our gravity well, you don't necessarily need chemical rockets anymore. Nope. We can use electric propulsion at that point, which means we may not actually need fuel stations. Uh, we could use something else. Having said that, the further away from you get from our sun, uh, like solar kind of becomes questionable, um, you know, that's kind of going to be the primary way to do it other than, yeah. you know, burning some sort of... Uh, Nuclear. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's, that has political ramifications to it. Very silly political ramifications. Very, you know, whether they're right or wrong, uh, it just has political ramifications yes. to it, which is a thing we have to deal with, so, you know. Yeah. Uh, it would be cool if we were able to figure out the electric propulsion to a point where we could go to the outer edge of the solar system and not have to worry about the number of photons hitting our uh, solar sail or, or our photovoltaics, our, our solar panels. You could do that with a laser. Get a big solar sail, really powerful laser, just, you know. At the edge of the solar system? Absolutely. If you had a, a tremendously powerful laser, you could do that. How tremendously powerful? Like a couple terawatts. Something like that? In orbit? Not so, on Earth. You're not shooting that through atmosphere. Uh, no, you could I mean, do it through atmosphere. Would you want to do it through atmosphere? I don't know. This is an interesting conversation. for someone else Park. to figure All right. out. All right, let's, uh, let's move on. <laughs> Next up, Capcom. Oh, yes. finally. This is the last one. Yes. Fi finally, Capcom. Finally. Uh, Here finally. we go. Oh, goodness. Let's see if I can not screw this one up, although I'm already looking at the last name, thinking I have no idea how to say that. So... This one comes off of YouTube. This one also is called, I can't talk. This one comes from Benjamin Halbison. Halbison? Halbison. Halbison? Maybe. It says, uh, wow. It's a hard H. Yeah? Mm-hmm. <sighs> Halbison. <laughs> says, from uh, Bastin. Wow, such a great episode. Every awesome interview and an unbelievably inspiring mid-episode trailer. If that's where you're headed in the future, I'll never miss a live stream anymore. Thanks. I, now, the question is, is he in the live chat room? Ben? Uh, ben, are you in the live chat Benjamin? room? Benjamin? Benjamin, wait, you, holla if you're here, and we'll, uh, we'll close out the show. Holla if you're here. Is, <laughs> oh, man. It's going to be hilarious. I feel so bad. <laughs> this, is why, this is why exactly why I'm not allowed to speak. We'll, we'll call you out on it. Oh, <laughs> All right. Uh, actually, I think live is better, right? And if, if you go to our live page, tmro.tv slash live, uh, you will see a schedule of all of the guests that we've got coming up, and we are now booked. Uh, actually, we just booked the last slot in September, I believe it was. So we're booked through the rest of. Is this the last show in August? There's one more. Uh, this is the last show right. of August. Yeah. So we, we booked. The, we so. did half of August. All of September is now booked, and nearly all of October is booked. So we're beginning the last week in October in November, and these are really great guests, really cool people. Yeah. Uh, will be coming on, and you can go over to tmro.tv slash live, and there's a calendar on the right-hand side, and I think you can add it to your own Google Calendar, I'm pretty sure. Uh, I have yeah. no idea. Yep, right. So it, was, it. it was really easy. Yeah, yeah. just uh, hit the plus symbol next to the chat room and uh, enter in your information, and, and it's really simple. I think live is much better, especially with these interviews, because you can ask your own questions, right? It's, uh, this is, we're bringing on really cool people 
uh, talking about things like Lunar Flashlight. And if you if you're like, oh, I wish they would have asked such and such. If you could join us live and in the chat room ask your question, those do get filtered to us, right? So and you'll notice we we ask them right in the show. Yeah. Uh, anyone can do it. So just join us every Saturday at 1800 Coordinated Universal Time. That is uh, what is that? 11 a.m. Pacific uh, Daylight Time, 2 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. And uh, yeah, I think it's I I think the shows are more fun live because you get to interact with us. Yes, I think it's pretty cool. Get to see the mistakes live. Yep. Uh, as well, co <laughs> couple of the, a couple of the changes that we <laughs> yes you do. <laughs> we cut some of those out. Uh, one other thing that uh, is going to be happening is we're going to be pulling out just the interview segment and posting that as its own object on YouTube. So you'll be able to watch the whole show or just the interview if you want. So that will be starting with this episode. Yeah. And then we'll also be taking the individual news segments and each news story will be broken apart and added as, as its own Facebook story. So you'll be able to share the news on Facebook and then share the interviews on um, on YouTube. We kind of, that all came out of our Slack channel. All right, that's our show for this week. I'd like to thank everyone so much for watching. I should have had, who do we have next week? I'm a terrible human being. Uh, on the schedule for September 3rd, we have uh, Rick, Rick Tomlinson. Tomlinson. That's if, right. If that's uh, the one. Rick yeah. Tomlinson. We're going to be talking about one of his uh, new conferences, uh, the, the uh, New Worlds Conference. Mm -hmm. It's going to be awesome. Uh, mm -hmm. I would talk to him on the phone, and it is very exciting stuff. He will be uh, he will be a very easy interview. I'll say, He's gonna run "Hi that Rick, interview. hi Rick, tell me about your conference," and then I'll say. Thanks, Rick. 30 minutes later, because he's just going to go and he's going to tell us everything you ever want to know so in the much. most excitable way. It is so, so cool. Much. Rick it's, is a, a fantastic human being. He yeah. is. I love everything he does. Uh, yeah. It's going to be an exciting and epic interview. So uh, make sure to join us next week. For those of you yes. watching live, After Dark is up next. If you are a Patreon Plus subscriber or abo above, that will be available immediately as soon as it's posted on YouTube. For everyone else, that will be available in about, uh, what is it, two weeks? Something like that. So thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.